take a minute and try taking the Stroop test. If you exit out of this recording and go onto the standard PowerPoint on the Moodle page, you will find the link to the Stroop test. The classic Stroop test asks, asks people to inhibit certain responses. You look at a field of words that are colored different colors. And rather than reading the word, you say the color. In this way, you are inhibiting your natural response of reading the word that's on the page and having to facilitate a response of saying the color instead. This test has to do with bilateralization among the brain, but it also gives us an important example of what it's like to inhibit certain attention responses and be able to understand what it's like to think about the impulses that any individual given certain tasks might have. Now that you're back and have tried the Stroop test, what effect on attention do you think the Stroop test has? In that Stroop test, what functions mental energy, processing control, production control were functioning or not functioning for you? Staying with the idea of that Stroop test, if you had to do that kind of challenging task in the classroom or a task that would challenge you in a similar way, how would you do? What if I asked you to do it for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour? What if the kinds of tasks that you ask your students to do were challenging them in a similar way? In that whenever they had to produce the desired response, they were actually having to consciously inhibit other responses or other ideas. Now remember the student you were thinking about. Based on what you remember about your student and what you've now learned about attention, what is your neurodevelopmental hypothesis? Go beyond just attention. Think of those three functions. Mental energy, processing control, production control. Where do the true breakdowns lie for the student you are imagining? Where are those functions working and not working? Now what about your whole class? Go beyond just a student. Think about some of the teaching techniques that you might use. Lecture, group activities, pair share, choral response, graphic organizers, just to name a few. What kind of attention demands do any one of the teaching techniques you choose place on your students? Think about this. Every time you lecture, you're actually requiring your students to have a fairly high mental energy demand. The task is really theirs to bring the energy to the classroom, to attend, to track the speaker, and to listen to all of the oral language output that you provide. There's also an extremely high processing demand. Everything that you say and demonstrate needs to be processed and internalized and sent to a child's memory. However, for the most part, in a lecture format, the production demands remain very low. Now let's think about an activity like a graphic organizer. Certainly the children have to attend it, and they have to be able to initiate the energy required to engage in the activity. They have to process it. 
but they're also required to produce information on that graphic organizer as well. In this kind of engaging activity, you're actually fairly balanced in the kinds of demands that you are requiring of a student. Now, in instruction, the goal is not necessarily to be balanced. So don't interpret what I'm saying to mean that a graphic organizer instructional method is necessarily superior to a lecture. Rather, what I'm advising is that teachers really consider what are their instructional methods and what demands are being placed on a child's attention by using any one instructional method over another. How can you balance your instructional methods throughout a day? How can you pair the kinds of instructional demands, or instructional strategies rather, that you use to the time of day, to the complexity of task, to the group of students that you're working with? Rather than just selecting instructional methods randomly, think about the needs of the students and the kinds of cognitive and particularly attention demands you're placing on the children by selecting the instructional strategies that you use. Here's some takeaway messages. I'd like all teachers to have these habits of mind. They should ask themselves, what function of, a, of attention is this student struggling with? And in what way can I intervene or support her? This is a much more productive question than simply saying a child has an attention issue or broadly thinking about attention as a singular thing rather than as a construct made up of discrete parts like mental energy, processing, and production. Another good habit of mine is for teachers to think about what they know about attention and how they structure their activities and assessments for their class and how they can utilize their students' attention strengths. Let me give you a basic example. When you give an assessment or an activity may have a large effect on how well your students do. Giving certain assessments or activities earlier in the day or earlier in the period may have a very beneficial effect on how your students are able to perform on those tasks. Here's a few classroom practices. Go online to the All Kinds of Minds website and look at the area for supporting students with an attention weakness. There are several excellent strategies that teachers can apply in their classroom. Also, keep in mind that good instruction is often varied instruction. Be sure that you're able to mix it up in your classroom. Having the same routines and the same instructional strategies day after day may provide consistency, but they're often a strain on a child's attention. Using a variety of instructional methods to help students helps their attention processing and also often aids in their comprehension. What could you do tomorrow? Implement some of the strategies that you thought about for your observed student. I asked you to think of a student, and I asked you also to think about things that you found on the All Kinds of Minds website or in Dr. Pullman's book. See if you could implement one of those strategies for the student you are thinking of in tomorrow's class. You could also try a new instructional method. If you often do group work, try something whole group with a graphic organizer. If you've never done pair shares before, give it a try and just observe its effect on the attention processing of your students.
you'll also want to take time to observe the attentional demands that your lessons place on your students. Is there any one activity or any certain time of day or certain topics that, team, that seem to stress the attention of your students more than others? These are important considerations when planning your instruction. Taking all of these things into consideration will often help you as a teacher be more effective and will often help your students make the most of the attention strengths that they bring to the classroom.